I'm Jim Kircher. It's Academy Awards time, and while St. Louis is not usually a city associated with movie making, it does hold a special place in movie history. Something happened here in the early days of silent films at Union Station that changed everything. It's said that the modern era of what we call movie stardom, it was born in St. Louis 112 years ago. On March 25th of 1910, a crowd was gathering at Union Station, awaiting the arrival of the woman who was known as the Girl of a Thousand Faces. The woman coming to St. Louis on the train was Florence Lawrence. She's considered America's first movie star, the first to be identified by name, the first to be sent out to make a personal appearance, and the first who was the subject of a movie studio publicity stunt. This ad in the St. Louis Times is a good introduction to the life and reported death of Florence Lawrence. There's a wild surging rush forward carrying police and barriers with it as the frenzied spectators struggle to greet and acclaim their favorite. This is the iconic scene of movie stardom, the premiere, the spotlight, celebrities exiting luxury automobiles, adoring fans pressing for a chance to see their idols, whose lives and loves, real or products of the press agents, were chronicled in the fan magazines. But this was the golden age of Hollywood. Back in 1910, the industry was still on the East Coast, and the age was somewhat less than golden. In New York City, D.W. Griffith's Biograph Pictures was turning out, really churning out, short one and two reel films from this modest building. It was really a movie-making factory, and the people in front of the camera, workers on the assembly line. One of them was a young, petite woman by the name of Florence Lawrence. But at this point, moviegoers did not know her name. Actors were not listed in the credits. But Florence Lawrence was becoming a fan favorite, even if they only knew her as the Biograph Girl. They would try to crank out two or three a week. And these were one reelers, usually maybe two at times. And I would say Florence Lawrence was in 200 of them. I, that's a rough estimate on my part, but she's in... Katie Pratt, a former editor here at 9PBS, has worked restoring Biograph films for the Film Preservation Society. She knows Florence Lawrence frame by frame. I would say, and this is just speaking in the Biograph realm, that there's definitely something about her as soon as she comes on the screen. And Griffith was very good about knowing what talent would appeal to audiences. He just had that gift of saying, you know, you've got whatever this is, star, star quality, I guess. Women were also swooning over the Biograph's handsome leading man. Later, they would learn his name, King Baggett. He would play a supporting role in the events in his hometown of St. Louis. I found that Tom Stockman has lectured on Baggett's film career. He could do comedy. He could do romance. He was a very good-looking man. The women just loved him. They just didn't know his name, not yet. There were a couple of reasons film players were anonymous. Moving pictures were not considered legitimate theater, and some stage actors who might make a film for money didn't want their name associated with it. But it was also to the movie studio's advantage to keep it that way. Joe McClintock's an amateur film historian who has dug deep into this story. Basically, there was a trust over in New York of about seven movie studios. They all worked together because they did not want to pay the movie stars too much money. So nobody knew who these movie stars were. It took this guy to change that. His name was Carl Lambley. He was later a major player in Hollywood as head of Universal Studios. But in 1909, he was just starting up a new movie studio that was not part of the trust, thus the name Independent Moving Picture Company, or IMP. And in 1909, Florence Lawrence left Biograph and went to work for IMP Studios. And Lemley decided that her fans should now know her by name. They should know when a Florence Lawrence movie was showing sold tickets right there. You didn't even have to say what film it was. I mean, I'm guilty of that. I'll watch any movie with my favorites in it. It doesn't matter what it's called. So I think that was the start of that. All Lemley had to do was turn a nationally known face into a household name. And this is where it gets interesting. 
There was a rumor, maybe a fabrication, that Florence Lawrence had been killed in a streetcar accident while shooting a scene in New York. Some versions said it was an automobile. Lemley then placed this ad in a film industry publication headline, We Nail a Lie. It says the rumor had been foisted on, are you ready, the public of St. Louis by his enemies, that Florence Lawrence was in the best of health, making movies for Imp, with her best work about to be released. Most accounts credit Carl Lemley with simply making up the rumor himself so he could deny it. But most accounts don't deal with the question, why St. Louis? Yeah, it was still one of the biggest cities in the country, had a couple of hundred places showing moving pictures and lots of fans. So maybe Carl Emily just picked a city's name out of a hat. But maybe, and there's a lot of maybes in this story, St. Louis actually had a pretty big role in all of this. Take a look. Weeks before Lemley's famous We Nail a Lie ad, the St. Louis Times was reporting this. Film poser is not dead. Poser was often used to describe film actors famous for their facial expressions. The subhead then uses her name, Miss Florence Lawrence, reported killed in auto wreck, still acting before camera. A fact, it said, that was confirmed by Carl Lemley. Joe McClintock thinks this early St. Louis report has been overlooked. The rumor was started, and I think it was started to sell movie tickets. Uh, but I don't think it started with Carl Lemley. I think it started with a man named Frank Talbot. He would have had his reasons. Frank Talbot owned theaters in St. Louis, including the Gem Theater, where the new imp films with Florence Lawrence were being shown. And people were coming. An earlier Post-Dispatch article on the local movie business makes no mention of Florence Lawrence's rumored death, but says hundreds of fans had been asking about where she was and were switching theaters to find her films. So another possibility to consider. It was a rival theater owner who started the rumor to keep his customers from heading over to the gem. Maybe Talbot didn't actually start the rumor, maybe he just took it and ran with it. Got the not dead news story placed prominently in the St. Louis Times, and in the same edition, his gem theater ad, Florence Lawrence, not dead, see her here in today's motion pictures. Was there a rumor? Was it a hoax? Was it Talbot's idea, Lemley's plan? Nobody really knows for sure. Whatever. It worked. The first time Florence Lawrence becomes famous is when they're denying that she died. The Globe Democrat took up the story with Florence Lawrence's surprised reaction to the reports of her death. And here's a feature story with some Florence Lawrence beauty tips. The Post-Dispatch ran a whole page on her, still alive. It was titled The Girl of a Thousand Faces. Determination, sadness, concentration, piety, coquetry, horror, hilarity. The photos and quotes coming straight from the Imp Studios. And Carl Lemley wasn't done. He got on a train with Florence Lawrence and King Baggett, co-stars of his new film, and they headed to St. Louis for two nights of personal appearances. And if you showed up at Union Station to greet them, you could get an autographed picture of Florence Lawrence. It was March 25th, of 1910. That day was really sort of the birth of movie stardom in America. The St. Louis Times seemed to be a partner in all of this with exclusive coverage. It reported that thousands of people turned out, mostly women, a bigger crowd, it said, than had come out for President Taft's recent visit. When Florence Lawrence got off the train, the Times said a flood of femininity swept toward her like an avalanche and that the crowd pressed her so closely that it appeared she would be trampled underfoot. Later accounts said buttons were torn from her coat as souvenirs. This might all seem like studio hype, but remember, nothing like this had ever been done before. I have no reason to think it was exaggerated. I think, I think motion pictures were, were fairly new, but there was a huge fan base for them, and I think people generally had this appetite to meet a movie star. Of course, that just kept getting more and more intensified, you know, throughout the 30s and 40s. And yeah, I would credit Lawrence Lawrence with, with having started that or having it thrust upon her, maybe. 
What happened in St. Louis that day set something in motion that now just couldn't be stopped. The Post-Dispatch ran a full-page story profiling other silent film stars by name. It said movie fans, or fiends as it called them, were now demanding personal news about their favorites. The following year, the first fan magazines hit the newsstands. And King Baggett, he now became known as the king of the movies. He was the number one movie, male movie star for a number of years, and he did so much. Uh, his career went very well. You can still find some of their films from the silent era, but so many have not survived. And for the most part, for the general public today, neither have their names. By the 1920s, they'd been surpassed by bigger stars making bigger pictures. They both continued to appear in films, but you'd be hard pressed to spot them. King Baggett as man in audience, racetrack spectator, theater goer, baseball fan. Florence Lawrence in 1933's The Silk Express as older blonde phone operator. She did have a small speaking part in this 1931 Hoot Gibson Western. She arrives in a buggy for a single scene. That's the man. She might not have said much, but Florence Lawrence could still make a face. He is the hard hombre. You big brute! Florence Lawrence's life was not going well. She was dealing with pain from a movie set injury and with bouts of depression. Later, suffering from an incurable bone disease, the first movie star committed suicide in 1938. King Baggett, whose acting career started in St. Louis theaters, died 10 years later. Their deaths made the news, but even in St. Louis, the stories made no reference to what had happened here in 1910. You know, by the late 30s, it was a, a case of, I'm surprised they remember who she was at all. This publicity photo was taken in 1935. It shows 10 silent film stars signing contracts to appear as extras in MGM films. And there they are, King Baggett and Florence Lawrence, who made movie history in St. Louis, together again for one more publicity stunt. For Living St. Louis, I'm Jim Kircher.